cleanse us of all impurity, and save our souls, O good one. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, for those on Facebook Live, I'm reader Colin Bauer. I'm a reader here at St. Vladimir's, and last week was our first Learning Orthodoxy. We talked about what the Orthodox Church is. So just to recap, the Orthodox Church is the body of Christ, and being the body of Christ is where the Holy Spirit dwells among men, and is, it is the source of truth, and it is where God reveals truth to man. So we are going to begin with what the Church believes about God, and kind of give a bird's eye view, because this is a very big topic. But, um, so God is the object of our belief. Um, in the symbol of faith, it begins with, I believe in one God. So, my Father Michael Pomazonsky says the first word of our Christian symbol of faith is, I believe, all of our Christian confession is based upon faith. God is the first object of Christian belief. Thus, our Christian acknowledgement of the existence of God is founded not upon rational grounds, not on proofs taken from reason or received from ex the experience of our outward senses, but upon an inward higher conviction which has a moral foundation. So while he says it's not based on rational grounds or it's not based on proofs or things of that nature, that doesn't mean that it's like anti-rational or it's against our reason or against proofs. It simply means that it's founded upon faith. Um, to, have God, to have faith in God, we must first recognize that there is something missing in ourselves, a fact that can be perceived with silent reflection. We were created to be in union with God, and without this, we will forever feel incomplete and restless. And this is really, this is evident, especially when you look at, um, so Father Moses was talking about this after Vespers on um, Russian Festival. He, he was talking about interviews with different celebrities and whatnot, and, and they would say, you know, I have all these things, and yet I'm still empty. And ultimately, nothing in this world will satisfy us outside of union with God. So this is what we were created to be in. This is, and so ultimately, we just, we have this need in ourselves to be united with God, and this is the driving force for union with God. That It's this hunger that makes people search, that makes people come to God, and ultimately understand who he is and receive him. So, first and foremost, the Creed says we believe in one God. So we believe there is only one God. There was a time when, and some people still believe it today, where they said there were many gods. You know, you would have, even some faiths had multiple gods that would worship. We do not believe this to be true. There is one God of all, and all else are false gods. So we would say, for example, the old Greek gods or the pagan gods were simply demons, masqueraded, guiding the people astray. And God has revealed himself to the church as who he is. So, and we believe in God through faith. Faith itself is a gift from God to man. It's, as St. Paul says to the Hebrews, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, which is about the most complete definition of faith we have. Um, and this faith is powerful. God says that with this faith we can move mountains. With this faith... People have been raised from the dead. The sick have been healed and all of these things. And it's not because we ourselves have faith. It's because this faith comes from God. This faith is a gift from God, and it's powerful because of who it comes from, not because of who has it. So, secondly, God is incomprehensible. Father Michael Pomazansky once again says, God in his essence is incomprehensible. In God's essence, which is the inner life of God, we, he is completely beyond our understanding. He's completely beyond our reasoning, our ability to see. He is, he is outside of creation and thus invisible. We can't see him. We can't experience his essence. So he, this is because he is outside of creation. He is above creation, and nothing created can perceive God in his essence. We perceive God in his energies, which is his activity in creation. So we know God exists because we have experienced him move in creation. And this is known as his energies, which we also call grace. The grace of God moves on earth. We see this, we recognize this, and because of this we know God exists. So, St. John of Damascus says that no one has, has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, he has declared him. The greatest activity of God on earth is the incarnation, is the moment when Christ came, the God-man, fully God and fully man, and revealed to us who God is, 
and gave us this faith that we have today. So it is in the Christian faith, and it is in specifically Christ, that we see this the greatest revelation that God has given. So in describing God, there isn't any word, really, that can truly get to his essence, get to who God is. And the fathers of the church, knowing this, they speak of God in a negative term for the most part. So... St. Cyprian, or sorry, St. Gregory the Theologian says that it's safer to speak of the Holy Trinity in terms of what he's not than rather than what he is, because human speech uh, will confine God. If we were to say God is X, Y, and Z outside of what God himself has said he is, it's dangerous waters to, to lurk in. So the fathers say what he is not rather than what he is. And this is evidence through the scriptures as well. So... Father Daniel Sosoyev says, we, have, we explain not what God is, but candidly confess that we have not exact knowledge concerning him. For in what concerns God, to confess our ignorance is the best knowledge. So the fathers will say things like he's uncreated, he is one without body, all of these things, and these are all negative terms. But what does God say about himself? Because God has revealed himself to us. And firstly, the thing he says is he is the one who is. So, in Exodus, Moses encountered God, and the first thing he asked was, what should I tell people your name is? I need a name, because names bear power. And God simply said, I am. And this can also be translated to, I am the one who is, which means God is the one who exists. God is himself existence, and he is the source and sustainer of this world. So everything that exists in a sense, only exists because God himself exists and sustains it and fashions it. God being above it, and yet it is because of the will of God that all else is. So God is the one who is. Nothing else is the one who is. And this really sets God apart from everything else, and this really reveals that he is the one God, because nothing else can be the one that is outside of him. So all that exists is below God, and it owes its existence to the will of God. God is the author of all that is outside of him. Being the author of all, we view him as creator. He, and in the creed, we say the creator of heaven and earth. So God created all that is outside of him, and all that is outside of him is below him, and he created it out of nothing. So before there was the created world, there was nothing. And God spoke, he said, let there be life, let there be earth, let there be water, trees, the birds of the sky, and he made man with his hands. So all of these things were created from nothing by his will, because he spoke it into existence. And it's sustained by his will. And it's not of him. So God has created this physical world, but he himself is not physical. We say God is spirit, and that's something that the prophets have said about him in the Old Testament. He is spirit in the sense that he doesn't have a body. He is the supreme spirit. He is the one spirit. Father Daniel Sosoyev says, God has no other existence, nor anything of what exists, but rather is himself the source of existence for all that exists, of life for all that lives, of reason for all that is rational, the cause of everything good for all creatures. So God is the source of good. He is the source of life. He is the sustainer of all creation. Now, when talking about God, we can talk about the attributes of God, since the human language can't really define who God is in a simplicity. We can touch on, in a sense, and get close to his attributes with certain words. So, this is even talked about throughout the sacred scriptures. In Exodus, God says, I am the one who is. In Jeremiah, it says, the Lord is the true God. In Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ himself says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Say it the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. And St. John in his first epistle says, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So while all of these things are descriptors of God, they don't fully define God, because that would limit him. They simply touch on and come close to who God is. It's impossible to describe God sufficiently in human terms, the fathers, knowing this, use negative terms, and we call this apoph apophatic theology. St. John of Damascus was a very big champion of this teaching. Um, in his book, The Exact Exposition of the Orthodox Faith, he says that God is without beginning, without end, uncreated, unchangeable, 
invariable, uncompound, incorporeal, invisible, impalpable, and it just keeps going. Any, any time he describes God, unless he's saying things that God himself said, like he is the one who is, it's always describing things God is not. And this is because, as I said before, it's the Father see it as safer to describe God by saying what he's not. In doing so, this touches on who he is, and it really just reveals by revealing what he is not. And it's, it's a very, it almost seems like a backwards way of looking at it, but it's, it's very eloquent. It's a very eloquent way of looking at it. So how do we know all this? Because this, uh, this all just didn't come from thin air. We have to know it from somehow, or from somewhere, and it's revealed to us in numerous ways. So firstly, it's revealed to us through creation. There's a natural understanding that these things exist, like this feeling that something is missing from us. We know that these things exist. So St. Paul, in his epistle to the Romans, says the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So in this book, he's talking about how the Gentiles really are just as good as the Jews in some case, because the Gentiles, while they weren't given the law, while they weren't revealed these, this way of living from God, still lived by it, lived according to it. And why is this? It's because creation naturally has this understanding of how things are supposed to work. And in us, even if we have not been revealed how to live, there is still the possibility that we can live in this way because we have a conscience. We have this understanding that there is a way to live. There is this deep desire in us to be in union with God, and even if we don't explicitly know who he is, St. Paul says that we may still live according to this law. And the Lord Jesus Christ, when the Pharisees tried to rebuke his disciples for saying he was the Christ, said, I tell you that if these, if these the apostles, should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. So creation truly glorifies God. Creation reveals to us divine truth. It's actually in a lot of iconography, and I'm sure you can look around at the live, at the events of the church. So for the transfiguration over here, the mountains are actually bowing towards Christ. And this is also true of many of the possible icons. And so also here for the crucifixion, the mountains are bowing away from Christ. So this is a stylistic depiction showing that creation recognizes these, this divinity, this, these truths. So even creation recognizes this reality. And it also says in the scriptures, all of creation longs for this redemption, longs for the renewal of the world. But this is also given to people by divine revelation. So God has revealed himself to us, and God has made himself known to certain holy men, chiefly in the incarnation of Christ, but also through the prophets of old and through the lives of the saints. Now, this cannot simply be received by anyone. For example, if you were if you had never seen light all of your life, if you lived in a cave, you walked out in the sunlight, you would probably go blind. It would just be too much for you to handle. It would be too intense. And um, even if you're, in, if you're in a dark place for a long time, if you walk outside, the sun is just too bright. It is too much, and you need time to adjust. So too it is with divine revelation. When, reveal, when seeing the light, the light of the world, we need to be able to receive it. So in the Beatitudes, which are sung, Every Sunday, every liturgy, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So it is those who live according to their natural state, or live according to the Christian life, that are capable of receiving divine truth. So Moses was able to walk with God because he was righteous. Um, the prophets were able to receive God because they lived lives in such a way that God was able to speak to them and they were able to receive. So in terms of divine truth, we are able to receive that which we are capable of bearing, so that which we are capable of perceiving. And that really is to the degree that we are capable of turning our lives to Christ. So it's not like we are, ever, all of us are expected to be great theologians, or all of us are expected to know all of these things. It's truly what you can receive in your heart, and it's based on how you live your life, how you turn to Christ. So God being one, has revealed himself to us in Trinity, in three persons. This is the second 
object of the Christian faith. God is one in essence, as we said, and his essence is unknowable, but he's revealed himself to us in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These are distinct persons, but they are all united in the one divine essence. So the persons of the Trinity are mystically related from eternity, meaning the persons of the Trinity have always and will always exist. So when God said, I am the one who is, he is not simply referring to God the Father. It's God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Even in Genesis, when creation is happening, God says, let us create man in our own image. He says, it is good to us to do these things. So it's even in the beginning, it's revealed to be a cooperative work. It's a plural. God speaks to himself as a plural. Or when God reveals himself to Abraham, he reveals himself as three angels. And this is believed to be a manifestation of the Trinity in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, there were revelations of the Trinity in its fullness. So we have Theophany. In Theophany, Christ is standing there. He's filled with the Holy Spirit to the point where light is being revealed out of him. And this was to the degree the apostles could see it. And it's also evident in the icon they're falling over because they're not able to bear the fullness of that. It would be, like I said, like they had never seen sun. And they see sun for the first time and they're blinded. They fall. But then God the Father says, this is my beloved son, hear him. Or in the baptism of Christ, Christ is baptized, the dove descends, which is the Holy Spirit, and God once again says, this is my beloved Son. So there are instances in the New Testament in which the Holy Trinity is made clear. Now, who are the members of the Trinity? There is the Father. God the Father is unbegotten, and he proceeds from no one. So the Father is known really in his relation with the Son and the Spirit. The, the Son and the Spirit are distinguished from each other in regards to their relation to the Father. This does not impl imply, however, that they are somehow lesser of stature than the Father, for the relation to the Father is from before time itself. It's from before when itself, as St. Gregory the Theologian says. The Son and the Spirit are of one essence with the Father. So how this relates to us is Christians are adopted sons and daughters of, of God the Father. Christ, being the Son of God, has taken all of us who are united with him, the Church, we are his body. We are one with Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit has been in Christ, and as such we are sons and daughters of the Father. And St. Paul speaks about this much in his epistles. And then there's the Son, the second person of the Trinity, and in the Holy Creed, we say he is begotten of the Father before all ages. We also call him the Word of God. So in the first, or in the Gospel of St. John, the beginning of it is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was with God from the beginning. So the Word is this concept that really was baptized by the Christians. This, um, so the Father, it can be, it can be said, St. Dionysius of Alexandria really says this, says, thought coming from itself is, as it were, the father of the word, and the word is, as it were, the son of the thought. So the word of God is the action of the thought. So God the Father thinks and the Son speaks. So it can be said that in creation, when God said, let there be light, the Father thought and the Son spoke. The Holy Spirit is the third member of the Trinity, and in the Creed we say he proceeds from the Father. So he is the life giver of creation. It is the Holy Spirit that breathed life into man and gave life to the world. This, Father Daniel Sosoyev says the Spirit is the creator and abides forever in the Son and reveals Christ to us and leads us to the Father through the Son. So the Holy Spirit is very, um, there have been many heresies throughout the church, especially regarding the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit really is one today that's still the most muddied. There are many people who see the Holy Spirit as a force or just an energy, but not as a person. But he truly is a person of the Trinity. In the Creed, we say he is, um, of what, uh, he is with the Father and the Son together as worship and glorified. What we mean by this is he is equal with the Father and the Son. He is of the divine essence. He is not just a force. He is not some Im impersonal thing. He is a person of the Trinity, and he is someone who we interact with in our Christian life. So the Holy Trinity is in one is one God, and in our prayers, in the services, and all of this, we refer to the Holy Trinity as one person. 
So we have prayers specifically to Christ. We have prayers specifically to the Father. We have prayers specifically to the Holy Spirit. But in the ending of each one, we conclude it with a triune. So we say that there's a prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll end it with, with thy Father and Holy Spirit, now and ever and in the ages of ages. So all we refer to God as one. We don't focus on one member of the Trinity. That's simply not something we can do. In all of our prayers to each of the members of the Trinity, it ends up including all three persons because this is one being. So why does this matter? I mean, I, I titled this, this class, Who is God and Why Should I Care? So why should we care about any of this? Because a lot of this seems like it might just not matter. And a lot of people just don't care. A lot of people will hear this and they'll just blow it off as if it doesn't mean anything. Well, simply put, we have two choices. We have the path of life and the path of death. And God is our creator. He is our sustainer. He is the source of all of our life. And if we wish to receive life, if we wish to be alive, we must be in union with God. It's, it's the only possible way. So in the Didache, which was a book written by the apostles, it says, this is the way of life. First, you shall love God who made you. And then there's a very long list of of what that means. So God is the author and source of our life. It is through living as we were created to live that we move towards God and that we enter into communion with him. So it is through living the life of the church. It is uniting ourselves to Christ, abiding in Christ, that we receive this life. Because it's through abiding in Christ that we receive the Holy Spirit. And it is through receiving the Holy Spirit that we become adopted sons and daughters of God and we receive this life. Now, the other way is the way of death. And the way of death is rejection of God. It's rejection of our natural calling. And this is, unfortunately, the most common way. So the Didache says, the way of death is this. First of all, it is evil and completely cursed. Murderers, adulteries, lusts, sexual immoralities, thefts, idolatries, magical arts. It is the way of per persecutors of good people, of those that hate truth, love a lie, and do not know the reward of righteousness, do not adhere to what is good. So... It's the way of evil. Now, evil is understood in the same way darkness is understood in relation to light, where it's simply an absence of. So darkness doesn't really exist. If we were to turn all these lights off, it would simply be not light, if you will. And that's what darkness is. Darkness is an absence of light. And so to evil is simply an absence of good. So St. Athanasius, for example, he never actually speaks of evil in the incarnation of the word. His, one of his most famous works, he says non-being. He says, we have entered, when we sin, into non-being, which is evil. Evil is a departure from reality. It's from existence. Departure from the one who exists, and ultimately it is an entrance into where we came from, which is nothing. We, we, were, we were created out of nothing, and if we reject God, we go back to nothing. At least that was before Christ, before God redeemed mankind, or mankind but we'll get into that next week. And in further weeks. And Father Seraphim Rose really touches on this a lot in his small book, um, it's God's Revelation of the Human Heart, which is an excellent book. He begins it by saying, ultimately a search, a religious search is a search for reality. It, and, it's, and he goes into great detail about how this reality can only truly be found in Christianity, how Christianity is the real expression of divine truth, because, re, because Christianity finds its source in the author of reality, or the one who is. So there are no other options. There's, you have life and you have death. You can't, you know, you can't choose option C. There's no none of the above. We have to make a choice. We have to choose whether or not we are going to operate in a way of life, moving towards God or moving away from God. Our Lord Jesus Christ in his Sermon on the Mount says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go and threat or thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So this concept of the two of the two paths of life and death is found throughout all of the scriptures. It's from the very beginning. God says, Eat of this tree and you shall live, or eat of eat of this tree and you shall die. Do not eat of it, and you shall live. And they enter into death. The final book of the Pentateuch, uh, it's Deuteronomy is Moses' last, is, is his farewell instructions to the people of Israel, and in the entire thing, 
is the way of life and the way of death and how to live accordingly. So this is our path that we have before us, the way of life and the way of death. And the way of life is union with God. Now, we've spoken about what we believe about God. I think it would be fair to talk about, for example, other people when they worship God who aren't us. So God is, God calls us to worship him in spirit and truth. The Lord Jesus Christ tells us we are to worship him in spirit and truth. So we who are Orthodox Christians, who have revealed, who have had this truth revealed to us, we must take what we've received and use it accordingly. We must address God as we understand him to be, because this is who he truly is. Those who are outside of the church, who do not have this truth, while they may earnestly believe, or they may earnestly try to pray to God, it's not God that they're speaking to. It's their perception of him, and it's going to be very faded, very dark. It's going to be seen dimly. So while this is true, we cannot say how God responds to it. We know in the Old Testament, whenever the Israelites failed and fell from God, God would say that their prayer was like an insult to him. He would say it was foul-smelling, it was evil, but this was his own people. So this is really in terms of how we are to live in terms of God. We are to live holy lives and pray accordingly. And I think that is where we will leave off this week. Uh, I've given a kind of a brief overview of the Trinity, but we're going to go into detail with the Son next week and the Holy Spirit the following week. Do we have any questions? Yes? Conceptually, if you were to put um, the Trinity in a um, diagram, would mm -hmm. you put, like, I think often the, the Romans put it as three intersecting circles. Mm -hmm. But they are not, or would you put like one circle on top of the other, on top of the other? Or, and, but you were talking about how the spirit flows through Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, I'm, I'm not sure conceptually, does that mean that? Well, it's, it's one the, is Christ is filled by the spirit. So mm -hmm. in, in, and it says this throughout the scriptures, Christ is filled with the Holy Spirit and he is, fought, is guided by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is fills Christ, and it's and so one one thing I've seen, one diagram I've seen, is there's a middle circle, and it says God, and then three circles on the outside, and, and it says Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all pointing towards the circle, says is, all pointing to the other, says is not, which kind of says they're all God in the sense that they all bear the divine essence, but they're three distinct persons, and that's a very, very complicated, and quite frankly, 2,000 years of Christian uh, living and we are still battling heresies that come up about the Trinity. So it's it's one of the most, and really it's because it's the central tenet of our faith. It, there is so much that goes wrong with it when people either think too much or they fall into these erroneous beliefs. They either live immoral living and out of this comes heresy. So it's it's a very complicated uh, doctrine, but ultimately it can be summarized in three persons of one essence. Any more questions? All right. So I say we pray and then we'll close it out. For anyone who's watching on Facebook Live and has comments, I will answer later. <coughs> Truly, me to bless thee, the play of gold, gold is ever blessed and most blameless.